My name is Angel Cholchev, Senior Product Manager. I'm responsible for the containerization, universal messaging, common central, and smart products. And I have good news and a bad news. My presentation is going to be only deck, but after me, John Carter is coming and he's going to show basically the mechanics behind those things in a lot of details. So let me directly jump on. Okay, so let's first speak about a couple of trends. The cloud, I think we just saw the future. Uh, nobody installed anything here. It just run somewhere and Dave just wanted this to run on premise. So, I mean, it's, it's quite easy. Everything's pre-built, you open a browser, you connect the dots there, it starts running. I will not go into the details. Where I'll go into the details is the constant urge of uh, modernizing the on-premise infrastructure. Even if you look at those um, two bullet points, you can see this as a two-speed architecture that we discussed earlier. One is the system of innovations where you need to act very, very quickly. So there you don't have time to install, apply patches, deploy around, you just need to get it running as soon as possible. And the other is the system of records that our companies need to move to run their daily business. And those things cannot be changed overnight. It will take a long time until our on-premise is different from what it looks right now. But still, there are, the, there are those new requirements for on-premise. And they're not new. I mean, we have been building for years a product called Common Central that was actually trying to make things at scale. But the way it tried to make things at scale was that it tried to just script around existing tooling that we have, uh, like the install, the update manager, the deployer, and to do it in scale. But even, even like this, it's still an old technology, an old way to produce this, and it's still leveraging um, you know, virtual machines or physical computers. That's what we needed. So those requirements, again, just to go quickly over them, Mobility of software, you know, to be able to put something, as we saw right now, from the cloud to on-premise or vice versa, to be able to change the data centers. Those are requirements that we hear for many, many years. Horizontal scalability. Some customers are not that interested, but others, like retailers, they have their peaks in their integrations. Uh, they have their Black Fridays, um, I don't know, Christmas times. They need to scale out. But do they need this capacity for the rest of the year? No, they don't. High availability, currently in the on-premise world, that's something that is being achieved through having multiple clusters, universal messaging, active-active, you know, setting a couple of servers, very cumbersome. Uh, if something happens with the network, probably the others, uh, you know, the other servers will not pick it up. Um, it's hard, you need to monitor it, you need to install quite a lot of machines on physical machines. It's, it's a different job. And then last but not least, automatic rollouts and rollbacks. Whoever could do it in on-premise has created probably, I don't know, special firewall, special uh, wall bouncer up front, then he's dragging around multiple on-premise installations. It's a hard job. So a couple of years ago, the containers came along. That's not a very new thing right now. But if you see there, they, they actually tick most of the, box, the boxes. So they're small and modular. They promote or they... Uh, they, they um, they say that you, know, you can just move them everywhere. Um, you know, this makes them easily runnable in a private public cloud, wherever you want them. Because they're small, they can easily scale horizontally. There are container orchestration uh, frameworks that are already quite mature. And they also have high availability by self-healings, which means that the, the container orchestration environment is monitoring the runtime all the time. When it falls down, a new container is being scheduled around. And you know, it pops up, you have the runtime again. Auto rollups, rollouts and rollbacks are also something that we have as a promise here. Um, and again, it, it works, so, but only in certain cases, which uh, I'm going to describe in the reality. So in the reality, this solution is working for stateless web applications mostly. So whenever you have state, something like databases, uh, messaging providers, systems that are having state inside, you cannot scale them very easily. It's hard to uh, run them in this environment. You have to make sure that uh, they are persisting their data um, in a place that is accessible for the new container when it starts up. Um, a very important thing here is also that this is not a turnkey solution. So 
At the beginning, we had quite a lot of customers expecting that, okay, they will just repackage the existing software in a different way, and then they will just get those things on the left side out of the box. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Those containers, they operate in a different way. Um, you need to take care of the network. First, they are immutable, which is quite a difference from uh, the standard virt virtual machines or the standard machines in general. And so they, I mean, they require a lot of knowledge to just get them rolling. So you need to adapt all your processes. You need to adapt, uh, um, you know, the way you develop the software, then the way you release the software, and last but not least, the way you operate the software, which is a quite a big investment that you need to do up front. And at the end, um, if you don't do it properly, you'll be lost in a the house there. I mean, it will be just quite hard to operate your solution and to update it. So, um, I'll jump to where we are right now. So, we started with containers, I think, five, six years ago, when we first decided, okay, we'll just repackage our software, we put it on Docker Hub. We were even on Docker uh, conference in um, Copenhagen, I guess, where we revealed we had a partnership with Docker, and on the Docker store, we put our products. But this was only the beginning of the journey. Since then, we realized that first, just putting a runtime inside of another packaging system, that's not enough. This was not good for the customers. Um, the way the customers could use those images, again, the images from Docker Hub, they were mostly trial images, so you could get the software. Um, you could try the software, but you couldn't really get the software to, use it to, to be used in production because it was, for example, not with the latest fixes. It was not really packaged in a proper way. So we have come quite a long way uh, afterwards, but the first thing that we did last year is uh, we kind of summarized everything in a piece of documentation that is now put in our system requirements document where everybody, when they start a project with the containers, have to go and take a look at those two metrics that just describe what out of our whole suite runs in containers, what is suitable for containers, because that's not everything, and then what is suitable for container integration orchestration, because that's the next abstraction level that we see afterwards. So a good amount of our products are already there. Less amount of products are ready for container orchestration. And even there are some more details, like as we mentioned, there are things like um, the, the auto-scaling or the, the zero downtime upgrades. Those things are not available for every product. As a good example here, Universal Imaging, that's a state, stateful product. It has state, it cannot scale automatically. You cannot just update the version quite easily. It has its limitations. And so are some of our, our other products. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, Docker Hub, our images there were not really usable. Creating the images was quite cumbersome because the first version of our containerization story was you just get the software, you install it on a machine, uh, you start installing the fixes, and then at the end you start running the scripts. And it was very, very, very complex. So people were not really very keen on it. I mean, there are quite a lot of problems, you know, keeping a machine only for this, then um, managing all the containers, also, the technologies were too much at the beginning. Uh, this led us, after a series of interviews and talks to our customers, some of which I see here, uh, this led us to the need that we needed to have our own public container registry. So some of you will ask, why do we have, and this is, by the way, released right now, and you can open it and try to download some of, some of the images, but if it doesn't work, be nice to me and tell me after the session and not during the session. Um, but what's new? What's the difference between this and Docker Hub? So first, we have here full control over the life cycle, over the legal, the legal matters around this. So we have our own um, legal agreements that you have to accept when you want to download our software. Uh, access to this container registry have, has every software AG customer, but also every customer that has, um, or every user of the tech communities. So this is also like we have a filter of who can download those things because, again, of legal um, export rights. Um, the life cycle is important because when we have issue like Walk4j that happened a couple of years, a couple of months ago, we just need to remove as fast as we can everything that can put the customers in danger. A very important difference is that whatever images we're putting here, they're production ready. They will have the latest fixes, so we will not have to go through cumbersome process to update 
um, an on-premise installation and then create the images. The idea is that the user experience for you should be much better. You should be able to just create, uh, to just write a Docker pull command and then get a software that is actually ready to be used. And then you can put this into your CACD and you can produce something that will work for you. Um, what we're doing again, as I mentioned, production ready. We're releasing every single fix of the products will be released here on this public container registry. Um, the thing is also that we're with the containers, we're a forward, that's a forward-looking initiative. We're not planning to enable containers for versions where we had problems, like 10.5. We're not going to release here older, um, older containers. It's only forward-looking. This means that from 10.11, um, all the fixes of 10.11 and then 10.15 and next versions, they will be released here, but we're not going back. We're not done porting functionality to all the releases, and we're definitely not putting all, putting all the releases here. A bit on the roadmap. As you can see, our public container registry was a key milestone in the roadmap. We put tons of work on it. Even if it looks like a small portal and Azure Container Registry, we needed to do quite a lot of legal work also, organize all the teams to release uh, regularly. And that's you know, a milestone that we just achieved today. Um, what we're doing right now is that internally we're starting to eat our own dog food. So what we're seeing that the customers um, you using the products and the tools that you've been using the last couple of years, sometimes you struggle with adapting to new technologies, like uh, questions like, hey, do I use the update manager to apply a new fix to a container? That's a regular thing. Or do I use the deployer? But you already know that the thing is immutable, so it doesn't really make sense. The same is happening in our company. So we need to start leaving the containers, and that's why we're promoting this in all our internal processes. This means that we'll eat our own dog food. As a result, our process, we're making it for the same reason that you're making it. Our build process will be much faster. We'll test a lot more. We'll test something that will later ship to you, the customers, without changing the environment variables quite a lot. So we expect that first we'll streamline our um, delivery of software, and then we'll have better quality around this. And then as a result, you'll see, for those of you that you're using containers, you'll see that our products will get much more mature, and it's in less than a year time. Another thing that we plan to do as an activity is regular test for Kubernetes and OpenShift. Now, those environments are quite um, particular, especially OpenShift. There, the devil is really into the details. We had quite a lot of cases last year where banks, for example, were trying to use OpenShift, and they stumble upon things like the base operating system is not supported correctly by us, or uh, the user is not the correct one, or the pets are not correct. All those things is just, it's a fast-moving environment here. So we have, I think, three releases of Kubernetes per year, two releases of OpenShift. We need to keep up. We need to stay on top of the things. And that's something that we'll try to achieve. And the last, but this will be for the next year because we, have, we are working on multiple fronts is that we have a lot of clear requirements where we need to get better. We need to get better in the, in the automatic configuration, in the monitoring of our tools, in the health checks, last but not least, the documentation. We do know where our gaps are, and we're planning to gradually work to close them um, in, 2000, in uh, 2023. A couple of disclaimers around the roadmap. Not only is this a promise, and some of those things will not make it, but also, some of the products will hardly make it ever. And this is where I put these disclaimers. First is the adapters. Okay, we say right now that we support integration server and MSR, but then almost everybody is using some kind of layer products on top of it. Those are the integrations that you're using every day. And you know that pure MSR, you know, it does some work, but it gets funny when you put adapters on top of it, or some of you have BPMS. So in terms of adapters, we aim to make them first-class citizens of the container story. The SAP adapter was required by many of you. This is now, as of now, this is certified for working in containers. Last for October 2022, we have on the pipeline the JDBC adapter, the Kafka adapter, and the WebSphere MQ adapter. So the most wanted adapters are going to onboard the container story. Next is the BPMS. 
That's a lovely product. A lot of you have been using it, and I'm getting quite a lot of questions in the last year. Um, hey, how can we modernize our BPMS? We want to put it in containers. We want to move it around. It will be just perfect. All our environment is uh, containers right now. Now, BPMS was engineered, this version, probably 20 years ago, and it worked perfectly when you put it in machine where all the products are interconnected together, uh, where you have the task engine and when you have, um, where you have things like database around and the messaging provider, all those things were kind of working extremely nicely together. But um, BPMS was always hard when it comes to CI CD. You know, moving from one environment to another, and it requires roughly the same set of products. Um, and now with the containers, it gets even more hard because you have those dispersed products that each and every one is holding some kind of um, state inside. Like when you deploy a process and you start running it, it has uh, things that are happening on the integration server file system. It has data in the database. It has some data in the, in the Myla methods in the task engine. It has data in the universal messaging or the broker. There is state everywhere. Now imagine getting this and just moving or trying to update parts of it every now and then. It's really a living hell. So if you start approach, if you approach a BPMS project, um, you know you better know what you're doing because um, it's not easy. You know you need a lot of deep knowledge about the BPMS itself and a lot of knowledge about Kubernetes and OpenShift on the other side. And last but not least, Optimize. Now, Optimize is one of the products where we can say, well, oh, it's not relevant anymore in this environment, just because, you know, what Optimize used to do, the products in the containers are mostly doing them itself. So they're providing, every single product is now providing quite a lot of metrics that are quite close to the metrics that were provided by Optimize for infrastructure. So there is no relevance of the Optimize for infrastructure in the product. And the thing that optimized analytic engine was doing, now we have open source alternatives, third parties, that could collect those metrics, also the walks, and can show you in a consistent way what's happening with your whole solution. And last in my last two minutes, I want to briefly discuss how you can approach a project when you have one. Because I already spoke with some of you that you're thinking about such a project. First, um, we made the documentation a lot better. Go check it out, figure out what's running, what's not running. Some of the things are not there. Um, BPMS, for example, is really hard. Um, you know, we do not officially support it. Then you need to acquire the knowledge. That's an important step. And I mean not the knowledge about what to do with the web methods, but the knowledge about this new environment and what to do with it. Um, it has, it, this is a set of new tools, a set of new practices, quite a lot of new things that you need to, to get familiar with. Um, the development process, it needs to be completely different. It's not a promotion of code anymore. You're promoting whole containers with all the variables and dependencies, and you can test them. And yes, it will bring you quite a lot of value afterwards because you're not changing the software, but then in the end time, it means completely reinventing your development process, your CI CD processes. And last but not least, you need to adjust your operations. Once you start deploying in production a solution that can scale and has, can have two instances in one second and 120 in the next second, the way you collect the walks, the way you collect the metrics, the, the way you look at the health of the system is completely different. And that's why you need to, again, leverage new tools and new practices, things like Helm from the deployment of the containers themselves, the uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Fluent Bit, and Kibana to just collect your walks that to, used to be you walk on the machine and you look at the walk, and Prometheus or Dynatrace if you're going into a more enterprise solution. Last but not least, that's here down, but it's a note here. With Software AG, where unfortunately we cannot provide full scale consulting around OpenShift and Kubernetes, those are extremely complex systems, and it's you cannot expect that by calling the global support, somebody can give you an idea of the five components that has to stay in front of the microservices runtime in order to make it scalable and runnable. There's just a disclaimer. We're also eating this, and we're trying to do our best, but we just cannot provide this at scale. Therefore, you know, we'll point you to our partner network or our companies that um, have this knowledge. 
And with this, my session is over, and I would like to give the stage to John Carter, my colleague, who will show you how this theory lives in practice. Thank you. <laughs>